Baron Cornelius Verheden de Lancy was a multi-talented man. Um, apart from speaking a large number of languages, he managed to be successfully a doctor, a surgeon, a dentist, um, qualify at the bar of the Middle Temple, and an art historian. How infuriating. <laughs> and he made a lot of money in the course of his life, and he was very public-spirited, and he set up a foundation to fund studies and thoughts and lectures on medico-legal themes. And his foundation gave money to Cambridge, which we use to fund occasional lectures on medico-legal themes, and that is the lecture tonight. It's my great pleasure to welcome Sir Peter Lachman, a most distinguished scientist, to give the lecture tonight which is going to bear upon the interrelationship between certain rules of the law taught and the availability of medicines. Sir Peter trained in biochemistry and medicine at Cambridge originally, and after being foundation professor of immunology at the Royal, Post Royal Postgraduate <coughs> Medical School, he came back to Cambridge as director of the MRC Molecular Immunopathology Unit and professor of immunology. Though he retired in 1999, he's still active in research, and ran a laboratory till 2005 and will open a small lab in 2011. He was founder president of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences, Biological Secretary of the Royal Society and President of the Royal College of Pathologists and served on UNESCO's International Bioethics Committee. And in these capacities, he became involved in the ethical and social aspects of medicine. He served on the SAB of Smith Klein Beecham and was co founder and chairman of SAB and Adrop Adprotec a company spun out of SB to develop therapies aimed at modifying complement function. He tells me that he and his wife um, descend into caves in the course of archaeology, and he's kept bees for many years, so he's used to a hostile environment <laughs> and being attacked from all directions by people who wish he wasn't there. So he is well able to descend as... Um, uh, Daniel into the lion's den or a Daniel into a den of li uh, a lion into a den of Daniels as the case may be and say things which will infuriate the lawyers um, so Peter thank you so much for coming over to you thank you very much John for an overkind introduction and for inviting me to give this lecture um, Unlike the founder, uh, who was a polymath and understood the law as well as medicine, and unlike many of your previous um, speakers, I feel very inadequately qualified to talk to uh, an audience of lions or Daniels, as the case may be. But I'm very grateful to John and also to David Howarth for giving me two supervisions um, to at least get me started. Um, this is the 50th anniversary of the withdrawal of the drug thalidomide. And what I'm going to talk about is the consequences that this had subsequently. And here's thalidomide for you. It looks entirely harmless, um, as much as chemical formulae always do. But actually, it wasn't quite harmless. Um, it was a drug that was probably developed towards the end of the war as an antidote to nerve drug poisoning. But it was patented in Germany in 1954 by a chemical company called Grunenthal and who launched it in 57 as an anti-emetic, particularly suitable for women who were pregnant um, and for treating morning sickness. And it was licensed all over the world, actually, except in the United States, um, where a very young uh, inspector called Frances Kelsey, who is still alive, declined to license it, not because she was worried about any side effects, but because the rats and some of the experiments didn't fall asleep, and she was therefore not convinced that it actually was an effective sedative. Um, for that reason, the use in the United States was very small. 
No studies at that time were done on pregnant animals because it was believed at that time the drugs either didn't cross the placenta or if they did, wouldn't harm the fetus. Um, that, of course, was a mistake. No, sorry. Um, between 57 and 61, um, more than 10,000 children worldwide were born with limb deformities. Um, in the United Kingdom, as I show you here, there were 2,000 of them, of whom 466 survived. Even in America, it wasn't licensed. There were cases because it was used in clinical trials. The most common abnormality, and I decided I wouldn't show you a picture, um, is phocomelia, which is absence of the growth of the limbs. Uh, this was probably the greatest disaster concerning drugs uh, that there's ever been with thousands of people. Though I do point out to you on the side that compared with the effect of the withdrawal in 1972 of DDT as a pesticide, it fades into insignificance because that actually caused millions of deaths from malaria since there was no substitute for it. And there are many people who believe that Rachel Carson, the environmental campaigner, and William Rickleshouse, who was the head of the EPA in America, who agreed to ban it, may have between them with the best interest in the world have actually killed more people than Pol Pot did. Um, but this is a bit outside our, um, our story today. Um, thalidomide uh, has actually not disappeared. It's actually a very good drug. It's now used for quite different purposes. It's used for treating a form of leprosy, and it's used for treating a form of blood cancer called multiple myeloma, um, and uh, it and its analogs are still in use. It's a rather sad story that in Brazil, where there is quite a lot of erythema nodosum leprosum, in spite of the fact that it is known that it causes fetal abnormalities, there have still been cases of phocomelia because it is so difficult actually to control whether women who are being treated become pregnant or not. So what happened? Well, uh, first thing that happened was that all drugs are now tested for effects on the fetus, teratogenicity, um, and that certainly is a good thing. Uh, in this instance, it was also perfectly appropriate that people should be paid compensation because uh, phocomelia doesn't otherwise occur, at least only with huge rarity, and therefore a direct cause between taking the drug and having the abnormality is probably true. Um, I understand that parts of the world, including here, there are still campaigns about the nature of this compensation going on. Subsequently, uh, there was another major consequence, which I'm really going to talk about, which is that the procedures for licensing drugs became very much more rigorous, took much longer, and became increasingly expensive. And I'll show you data about this. And I'll give you a little quotation here from the um, Your Active, pointing out that it was a response to this thalidomide disaster that caused the European, first European directive about this. And the second... And, possibly even more difficult to deal with consequence, is that the public tolerance of risk with regard to prescribed medicines became almost zero and became totally unrealistic, because it must be pointed out without any doubt that any drug that has any pharmacological action can also have side effects. There is no drug, and never has been, that is absolutely safe. And of course, we use drugs, all of us, like aspirin, which if they were to be licensed nowadays would certainly be refused a license because they're much too dangerous, um, giving rise to gastrointestinal bleeding in quite appreciable numbers of people, and um, they would never have got onto the market. Um, I'll come back to the question of herbal medicines a bit later. So putting a, little fi a few figures on that, I'm going to show you a few slides about actual figures. Um, it now takes more than 10 years, probably, and on average costs more than a billion dollars taking into account failures of drugs that are withdrawn to take a new drug from discovery to market. That is quite a lot of money. One of the consequences of this is it's quite impossible for academic departments or small biotech companies to take a drug from discovery to market. This can only be done by large pharma who has the resources to deal with this, and that isn't a tremendously good idea because a large pharma which has major responsibilities um, 
to develop things may not be that interested in doing things that are fairly high risk and which, if it could be done more cheaply and more innovatively, could be done much better by small companies. If you compare drug development with new developments for the Internet, which are largely produced initially by very small companies and the way it's gone terribly fast, you'll see the difference. And it's also led to the fact that companies tend to concentrate either on diseases that are very common, where they can make blog, blockbuster drugs, and this causes a lot of me tooism in drug development, um, and not to deal with diseases of intermediate um, frequency. Very rare diseases are subject to separate legislation, the so-called orphan drug legislation, which makes them a little easier to deal with. But the ones in between tend to get neglected, which includes, actually, there's quite an interesting story. In my own field, it's the complement field, and we've been trying, as John mentioned, to develop complement therapeutics for donkey's years. And nobody was ever very interested because all the diseases we were interested in were pretty uncommon. A few years ago, it became apparent that age-related macular degeneration is in fact largely due to abnormalities of complement, which had not been suspected. And that, of course, is very common. That has a potential um, audience or clientship of millions and millions of people. Uh, and now companies are getting seriously interested in this again, so that uh, it makes a big difference. And then the other thing we're going to talk about is litigation. Um, it's become a habit uh, to sue drug companies for harm from side effects, and that also has a very bad effect on drug costs, and also, as I will tell you, has other highly undesirable side effects which we'll come to. And these, of course, were not... Intended consequences, these were unintended consequences, and I thought I might just bring to your attention the origin of the law of unintended consequences. This is Robert Merton. He lived till about 2000, but after having written this paper in 1936, he always intended to read, write a book about it, but never did. So it's you know, more or less still there. His son actually won the Nobel Prize for economics afterwards. Um, and he has, has, says it's often cited, but rarely defined as actions of people, especially government, always have effects that are unanticipated or unintended. And he gives five sources, ignorance and error, which nearly always occur, um, uh, the uh, imperious immediacy of, um, uh, of interest. Um, uh, that uh, counts for the problems we're having with the current reforms of the National Health Service. Um, uh, Basic values, well, an interesting example of that is the European Physical Agents Directive, which uh, restricted the amount of irradiation that people could be exposed to, um, and therefore, if implemented, would have made, brought an end to all medical magnetic resonance imaging, which exposes people to more than this amount of radiation. And when this was pointed out to the Director of Worker Protection in the EU, she said that didn't matter, all workers are entitled to equal protection, a statement of quite unparalleled inanity, since the first consequence would be the abolition of the fire service, <laughs> followed shortly afterwards by the police and all of medicine. Um, so that is the imperious immediacy of interest. Um, basic values, um, yes, uh, no, I mean, basic value, sorry, we've done the self-defeating prediction. Yes, there's another good example of that, and that is waiting time, uh, waiting time targets in medicine, um, because they believe that this will mean that people are seen more quickly. In fact, of course, if you impose waiting times on doctor surgeries, you see fewer patients every time, because in order that people don't have to wait longer, you actually book fewer people in. So the effect actually is the exact opposite of what's intended. However, this is um, all words... This, I recommend to all of you, is the statement of the law of unintended consequences um, uh, that actually says it all. This is a cartoon by Mike Walsh. Um, the line at the bottom, actually, I added when I gave a copy of this to Brian Mawinney when he came to a dinner instead of Virginia Bottomley, who was then Secretary of State at the College of Pathologists, and I thought perhaps he wouldn't understand it. Um, <laughs> He certainly wasn't amused um, and said he'd never been called a frog before. <laughs> and I bit my lip very hard and refrained from saying what I say now, which is, Minister, 
You are not the frog, that's the health service. You are the princess's lady in waiting. <laughs> if I may butt in, it's a small print to look at the back. It says, it seems such a pity because as a frog, he was a really terrific swimmer. Yes, I'm sorry if you can't read that. That's right. And this is the princess, and that's, yes, that's the prince who's just drowned because he can no longer swim. Yes, thank you, John. I didn't realize it. But every, every decision maker should have a copy of this um, hanging in his uh, or her room. Now, to come to the actual problems, the problem of drug development, as I say, this applies to prescribed drugs. Alternative and herbal medicines are largely exempt from regulation, although it has to be confessed the MHRA, which is the Medicine and Healthcare Regulatory Authority, has recently tried to produce a regimen for homeopathic medicines, which, since they are only water, is actually extremely difficult to do. <laughs> but the intention of regulation is to ensure purity and consistency. Uh, that is very important and never applies to herbal medicines. They're never the same thing consistently. Studies of metabolism and clearance, animal studies, safety and efficacy, safety and efficacy studies in man. And there is no dispute that these are necessary. If you don't have these, um, there's a great danger of people being given uh, things that are really of no value, and this is of vital importance to protect the public. And the process of this, given briefly, uh, this is from NICE, which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, Excellence, and I give you what MHRA and NICE mean here. This is very briefly the life cycle of a medicine. Somebody discovers it in some way we can't discuss. There are many ways in which people decide things, uh, do things which may be useful in medicine. This is then uh, explored further to see if it can be applied to human medicine. This is what's called translational research. And then one starts having to do studies um, of efficacy and safety. And when these are being completed, the drug is licensed, gets authority to be sold. It's then manufactured and distributed and clinically used. But bear in mind that um, appraisal occurs here. I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, experiments on how best to use the drugs go on forever after licensing. Licensing is not, does, is not the end, it's, it's the beginning. And to put it in a slightly more formal phrase, and I'm, this is by courtesy of Kent Woods, who's the chief CEO of the MHRA, um, you begin with discovery research, you go on to this preclinical development, biological testing, pharmacological screening, half-lives, and then you have three phases of clinical testing. Phase one is done usually on normal subjects. Um, there are exceptions to this. I mean, highly toxic cancer drugs are never tested on normal subjects. But in general, they're tested on normal subjects to see that they're safe. A slightly bigger phase two style is then done for efficacy, which, of course, is done on people who have this, the illness you're interested in, so that you can see that it does any good, either against placebo or against best available treatment. And up to there, it can be done by fairly small companies. These are fairly small trials. And then you go on to what are now these huge phase three trials um, to look at efficacy in much more detail and to look at rarer side effects. And phase three trials comprise more than half of the total cost of developing a drug. They're then reviewed by the MHRA, and then you get licensing, or not as the case may be, and then post-marketing development, where you continue to do controlled trials to see how to use drugs better and where they may be used for new indications. Some drugs um, do worse when you release them, than you expect. Others occasionally do startlingly and dramatically better. Um, aspirin was found 100 years after it was introduced to be very effective in preventing colon cancer. And, um, statins, which many of us take to lower our cholesterol, actually have a far larger effect on cardiovascular mortality than the cholesterol-lowering effects can explain, and they're probably anti-inflammatory. Um, otherwise, quite often, effects are less good. One of the reasons for that, of course, is that no trial population is ever representative of the population which finally takes the drug, not least because there are people who are willing to take part in trials, which is already a highly selective characteristic. Um, and they're also made sure that they actually take their medicines, which, of course, a lot of people don't. Now, the consequence of this, I'll show you quickly some, um, uh, some figures to alarm you. This is from the Boston Consulting Group. A lot of these things from 
uh, from the states, and this is the cost per molecule that comes to market, taking into account the failures. And you can see that this is going up exponentially in an entirely alarming fashion. So that they, at the present time, they think it's about 2.3 billion dollars to bring a drug to market. That's even higher than the figure I quoted earlier. And these are all modelled figures, so you must take them all with a slight grain of scepticism. And they predict this is going to up, go up to 3.8 billion by 2015. Um, who is going to pay for that is mysterious. Um, this is putting it another way, and it's from a different research group, and I'm very grateful to uh, a gentleman from Roche, whose name I've often forgotten, Dr. Richard Peck, uh, who very kindly sent me these. Um, uh, the NMEs are new medical entities, and this is per billion dollars spent, and this is the number of new drugs that come to market at this expenditure, and you can see they've drawn a line right through it, but actually it's fairly stable until thalidomide, when it suddenly begins to decline in a rather alarming fashion, and it's continued to decline ever since. And, you know, this is structure of DNA, this is when molecular engineering starts, um, this is when human insulin is first made, a genome product, Dolly, uh, tremendous improvements in the basic science and a huge reduction in R&D productivity. It gets better here when the FDA has a new law which allows them to charge drug companies for doing their investigation, so they had some more people to do it and they got a bit faster. But it's temporary and it's still going down. Um, and that is actually also extremely alarming. And uh, they, this particular group um, of identified three causes for this. Um, the first one is the one that's of interest to us, uh, the cautious regulator problem, which I'll come back to. The better than the Beatles problem sounds rather nice. That's a way of saying that all the easy drugs have already been made and what's left is much more difficult. Uh, I'm not sure that's true. The rational design fallacy, I don't think is a fallacy at all. Um, it is again quite common that when things appear, such as the idea that you can design drugs rationally from the underlying biochemistry, everybody thinks, wow, in five years' time, no drugs are going to be made by any other method. And that's never the case. These things are very slow. And in the first 20 years of rational design, the only rationally designed drugs ever made were the neuraminidase inhibitors used to treat flu, which are useful, but were nevertheless unique at that time. But it's coming. But the cautious regulator problem is what concerns us here, and this is their definition of it, the cumulative ratchet-like effect of the regulator's low risk tolerance. Each sin by the industry, lovely term, or genuine drug misfortune tightens the ratchets and few events ever loosen it. In fact, um, what drives the caution of the FDA is fear of being phoned by congressmen, um, which apparently happens all the time, and they are driven to ever greater caution by fear of Congress. Um, the MHA, I think, personally, is driven less by fear of MPs than by fear of the tabloid press. Um, I haven't given you any examples, but you will all have seen plenty. Drug scares make the um, front page of tabloid press as much as you like. Now, these are, this is some data about, again, from America on uh, cancer drugs at launch how much they cost per month, and you can see that's going up exponentially as well. So they did now cost something like 7,000 US dollars at 2007 prices for a month's treatment, compared with about 500 um, as recently as the 1980s. And this is some British data. This is from NICE. And um, so Michael Rowland sent me this, who's the chair of NICE, shows the huge difference in development costs between different drugs. Um, and this is expressed in actually a much better way. This is the eventual incremental cost per quali. Qualis are quality-adjusted life years, which is actually what people should be looking at. In other words, how much good do you actually do with the drugs? What is, how many quality-adjusted life years do you get per dollar? And you can see with some drugs, the number of dollars you need, over $100,000, that is largely unaffordable. I can tell you the figure for developing vaccines in the United Kingdom the Department of Health uses is £30,000 per quality. Um, so, you know, this is getting totally out of the region. On the other hand, some drugs are very good value. And I just want to say a word or two about this drug 
rituximab. Because that was developed in a rather unusual way um, uh, and is of some interest. Rituximab is a monoclonal antibody against an antigen found on lymphocytes, and this was developed by a physician in Seattle, the original monoclonal antibody, to treat his father's B-cell lymphoma, um, which he did, as I'll show you in a minute, without any regulatory approval because you don't need any. And when this was found to work, it was then sold to a drug company who made, humanized it, and it, IDEC then made it, and he uh, released it for treating B-cell lymphomas, and then lo and behold, I'm treating, I hate it. David Jane knows so much more about this than I do that it embarrassed me to say so. It turned out to be immensely useful in rheumatoid arthritis and in lupus and in vasculitis. And quite unexpected. It's actually a hugely successful and important drug. And it probably would never have got there as quickly as it did except for this invaluable um, exception to all the rules, which is the name patient exemption. Um, uh, the, the legal statement is in paragraph one, uh, interpretation for medical profession um, within the other paragraphs which allows a doctor in good standing acting in good faith with therapeutic intent to treat his own patients who have given their informed consent with anything including things he's made himself without asking anybody um, and to give you a little example in Addenbrooke's we have for the last quarter century or more been making harvesting our own wasp venom um, and we, when we started this, there was no uh, commercial wasp venom for desensitizing people available. There now is. The product is much worse than ours, much dirtier, um, and much more expensive. And we collect this from wasps' nests. It's the pharmacy filters it and sterilizes it, and we inject it into patients, our own patients. And we have been assured we can do this forever. And uh, it has never been tested for toxicity. I mean, we know wasp venom is toxic. Uh, we know its effects on humans when they get stung by wasps. I mean, this, it's all quite pointless. And this you're allowed to do. If we wanted to sell it, we would have to go through all this rigmarole. Um, and then it would take years and years and years and cost a fortune. But this is terribly important, the name patient exemption, and vitally needs protecting from interference from Europe where it's always in some danger. Uh, this is... Just to point out to you that even the richest countries are not going to be able to afford this. This is a, um, comparing gross national product with health expenditure in dollars. And you can see that even in uh, countries uh, with the highest GDP, the United States presumably at the top there and others, um, the expenditure on health care expenditure is reaching figures that are really almost important. They don't sound huge, but of course this is per person, including all the healthy people. Um, that actually is becoming extremely expensive. If you multiply this by the millions of the population, you'll realize that this becomes to a huge figure of the part of the GDP. Now, the remedies. Now, it is the 10th anniversary of my starting to campaign on this. And um, the first... I actually like this. I thought I would show the lawyers a slide at the beginning. That's how the law keeps us in. Uh, this is an article by my friend Mike Hanlon, who's a journalist, which he wrote largely at my instigation, and he writes terribly well. But you can, we can't go all through this, but the points he's making are all the ones we actually want to make. But he says that while there have been tremendous scientific advances, um, uh, its development has been very slow, and this is due to the newfound obsession with 100% safety and the growing laws, role of lawyers and litigation. So it's all your fault. Um, I said that the regular regime for drug approvals imposes very high costs for the few lives saved, which I would still say now. And mindful of thalidomide, it now insists on tests so rigorous that the introduction of new product can take a long time and be very expensive. And the example he gave here, which is also worth exploring a little bit, is a drug called Opron, uh, which was a drug at that time for treating rheumatoid arthritis, a very effective painkiller. Um, it did give rise to side effects, and it could cause mortality in elderly people, particularly if they expose themselves to light. And because it had been rather unfortunately advertised, it was simply withdrawn. Um, uh, and the interesting story is that the pharmacist at Addenbrooke, who had rheumatoid arthritis, when it was withdrawn, took the whole supply home. So that she at least could continue to take it. She knew the risks, and actually it was an extremely 
extremely effective drug. It isn't any longer than a much better drug. And finally, um, with this business uh, fueling all this precaution as the fear of litigation, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, and he says, already patients who willingly took part of trials of drugs to combat AIDS are starting to see side effects. And this lovely um, phrase of his, when the lawyers start to circle, disclaimer signatures are worth far less than the paper they are scrawled on. Um, and the final point, which I hadn't highlighted, but will say a word about, we took this up with the Department of Health, um, and one of the people said, yes, of course, in theory, they approved of fewer people dying rather than more people, but actually, if one of the fewer people happened to be your mother, they wouldn't see it like that. And I thought that was a deeply shocking remark for somebody who makes public policy to make, actually. Um, well, five years ago, David Cooksey, in a report he wrote for the government, actually made much the same points. Uh, again, he, this is, he just said, the regulations are too complicated, a health technology assessment happens too late. Um, he made some uh, firm suggestions, there should be earlier conditional licensing of drugs, and the use of the NHS information programs uh, should be used to assess emerging site effects and efficacy over longer periods. In other words, it should be done post-marketing. It's quite interesting that although some of the Cooksey report was implemented, this part of it was totally ignored, and no action was taken by the government of any kind about this. Um, and at the time, still, it was unpopular. I remember being invited by Alastair Breckenridge to a meeting about these Cooksey proposals, and he said he was asking, because he was the only person... He, I was the only person he'd met at that time who actually agreed with Cooksey. Times have changed. It's an idea whose time has come. This is much more recently, this is an, from an American source, um, not a source I actually approve of. This is a, a somewhat right, a politically unsatisfactory think tank. But what he says is quite right. Uh, what he says, there should be more choices and better health, and one should be free to choose experimental drugs. Um, uh, and he says it's not a question of reforming the uh, Federal Drugs Agency. Uh, there should be a, a dual system where patients who wish to um, can take drugs much earlier. And what he actually proposes is very much what I'm proposing, uh, which is, you can, the slide is now familiar to you, that patients at the end of phase two should be allowed to opt to take the drugs if they wish to. And curiously enough, only half an hour before I came out today, um, there appeared an item on the scientist website reporting from Bloomberg News 48 hours ago that an American senator is proposing um, to the uh, American Congress a um, lady called Kay Hagan um, uh, to get a faster approval um, for drugs, um, especially for rarer diseases uh, rather than common ones. Um, to get this through the American Congress in the near future. So it will come, one hopes. So what we're proposing is the abolition of phase three trials. Um, it would cut both time to market and cost by about half. It would encourage companies, as I've said, to develop drugs for less common diseases and allow far more companies to do this. Um, Post-marketing surveillance would be used for monitoring both efficacy and side effects, and the UK is an extremely good place to do this because there are now growingly efficient information systems in the NHS. Again, some of my medical colleagues may laugh at this because there's been a frightful problem with the NHS information technology, but it is getting better. Um, and there will be databases which will allow efficient efficacy as well as side effects to be monitored. Um, so one doesn't need to put anything very new in place for this. And trials to improve the use of drugs will, of course, continue after licensing. Um, some drugs will fail after licensing. Some already do, and some unforeseen side effects they occur. Uh, that also happens. Uh, the frequency of side effects at phase three trials takes it from about one in 100 to one in 1,000. Things that occur much less than one in 1,000, you're very likely not to pick up anyway, except by post-marketing surveillance. Um, the real question is whether phase three trials actually save any lives at all. In other words, whether the number of people who come to harm by not having the drug for many years when it could work um, actually outweighs the side effects that you're preventing by phase three trials. Um, and that is something which it would be interesting to get data on. I've put it here in slightly 
the simpler terms, but it's important for this audience because uh, what one wants is that after phase two trials, remedies should be made to those who want them, uh, who've been given all the information, providing they can waive the right to sue in a form that will stand up to the law and who also agree to participate fully in surveillance. They'd also have to recognize that no remedy is ever drug-free. And the point I've just made to you is that one might then actually be able to um, decide whether phase three drug trials um, have a positive or negative effect on qualities, and the guess is it has a negative effect. And I was actually hoping to have some data for you from the Institute of Ophthalmology about how many people have gone blind because it took so long to uh, license VEGA inhibitors for the late stages of macular degeneration, but uh, they're not yet available. So how would we do this? It would itself need to be trialed. You wouldn't, uh, the way politicians love, do it all over, immediately all over the country for every drug. It would need to be trialed to see how it worked. The potential patients would be given all the information and would be explained the risks and uncertainty. They would then sign an indemnity. And here is the problem um, that I've learned about from my colleagues. This conflicts with the strict liability provisions of the Consumer Protection Act and of the European Directive on Product Liability. And this is a problem for you lot to sort out. Here's the Consumer Protection Act. I apologize. I couldn't get rid of this blueness from Wikipedia. Um, I was interested to find that this was the first time that a a European directive has been directly put into English law, and that introduced strict liability, which was new. Um, uh, there may be criminal offence of giving misleading prices. That doesn't interest us particularly here. Um, it was the first time that an uh, EC directive had been implemented. Not a good start. Um, the Consumer Protection Act, and I thank David Howth for these explanations, um, is that the safety of the product is not such as persons generally entitled to expect. The court must take into account warnings with respect to doing or refraining from doing anything with or in relation to the product. I do love legal language. This means that although it's not possible to exclude liability by notice or contract, i.e. you agree that you can't sue us if this goes wrong, which is what is needed, it is possible to affect the level of safety persons generally are entitled to expect by giving suitably clear warnings about the risks. Good. Now, there is this case which apparently is still in force, um, which said that people are not entitled to expect absolute safety in all circumstances, which is true and helpful, that there can still be liability even when the level of safety they do expect is in fact physically impossible. That is actually a totally meaningless statement when you think about it. Uh, it doesn't mean anything. But the third statement is much worse. It says that risk-benefit calculations don't count, and it doesn't matter that nothing could have been done to make the product safer. That is totally mad. Um, and it is totally mad because risk-benefit is at the center of all medical decisions. Whenever a doctor is confronted with a patient and has to make up his mind, he takes risk-benefit ratios into consideration, and sometimes cost-benefit as well. This is absolutely central, and to say that it doesn't matter with regard to drug toxicity is simply crazy. It's also important because it allows consideration of public as well as individual benefit, i.e. there's a utilitarian aspect to it, very important with regard to vaccination. Um, and uh, again, uh, David pointed out to me that risk-benefit now is a standard practice um, in the tort of negligence and judging reasonableness, well, that includes benefit to others. And he says the case laws contained the idea for more than 60 years and was somewhat pointlessly repeated in the statute in 2006. And one of the central problems of strict liability is it fails to take account of positive externalities, which are all the things we're talking about. In other words, it really is not reasonable that strict liability is applied to this at all. It's not appropriate. Nevertheless, I mean, drug regulation aims or claims, whatever you wish, to achieve favorable risk-benefit and cost-benefit ratios. That's why we have NICE. You know, we've set up a whole organization to look at this. In practice, however, it's a pious fiction. The real concern, particularly in the States, but increasingly here, is actually fear of litigation. And the public, at any rate those who write on blogs, because I've been actually looking at this on websites, enthusiastically support suing drug companies for anything under the sun. And they do not realize 
that the person who pays the damages is not the drug companies, it's the consumers, because these damages are simply added to the cost of drugs. Drug companies have to make a profit, and this is just written into the expenses, um, both the damages and the lawyers' fees, are written into the drug prices. And this, therefore, is, is, is not a public good. Litigation is also unfair uh, because it compensates only where fault can be shown. I uh, point out to you in many of these statistical side effects, you don't actually know whether the drug is at fault. So somebody who has a heart attack because they think it's due to a drug may get a lot of compensation. Somebody else has a heart attack, it's nothing at all. Um, and we'll come back to this other question of whether there are better ways of doing this. Um, what I am not saying is that where people are harmed by negligence in, negligence in the conventional sense of the word, not taught of negligence, fraud, deceit, or other uh, bad things, they should certainly be expected to be held to account. People who advertise drugs improperly should be fined. There's no doubt about it. Um, uh, and there have, I've been very unfortunate episodes of people being deceitful about drugs, and there's no doubt that the law has an important role there. But these are all relatively minor cases. What most litigation is based on um, uh, are statistical side effects. You have a drug, and I'll give you a couple of examples in a moment, where your likelihood of having some event, um, getting diabetes, having a heart attack, various other things, is increased by some percentage, usually quite small. It can never be shown in any individual case that this is causal, because these are just statistical side effects. And uh, this has become the, 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 the main feeding ground of class actions against drug companies. And it probably is unjust, it probably has no proper justification, and it certainly does great harm to healthcare. I'll give you a couple of examples. AstraZeneca, both are British drug companies. AstraZeneca have an antipsychotic called Seroquel, which is quite effective. And that is claimed to cause diabetes and obesity. Very difficult to establish in a population which have lots of obesity and diabetes anyway. Um, and when this was tested in court in the United States, it was actually ruled against. The jury uh, did not consider that the claim was worthy. And various other cases had also been dismissed in the States. Nevertheless, a few months later, AstraZeneca settled class actions from another 17,500 patients um, and paid about $198 million um, as damages in this class action suit, um, money which will undoubtedly be recovered in the cost of drugs. Um, the other example, uh, perhaps even more interesting because it's, 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 it's a bit more difficult, is uh, rosiglitazone or Avandia, which is a well-known anti-diabetic drug. It belongs to class of drugs known as PPAR gamma activators, which increase insulin sensitivity in type 2 diabetes, uh, an important thing to do. And that is claimed to increase heart attacks and angina and things. And compared particularly with a, another drug on the market, which is very similar, which is said to do this less. And I've actually, there are some figures here for those who like this sort of thing. The odds ratio for the composite harm of acute myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure, or all-cause mortality in patients 65 years or older was 1.18. Um, that is not a great deal. It corresponds to uh, somewhere between one and a half and two extra events per 100 person years of treatment. Now, at the age of 65, um, you're, uh, uh, you know, uh, 100 person years of treatment is quite a lot. You're dealing with a population who are going to die rather sooner than that. Um, Pyoglitazone is slightly safer with regard to CVS events, um, but has also its own problem that there is some association with bladder cancer. Um, they're both valuable drugs in controlling type 2 diabetes, and it's not immediately clear that the drugs one could use to replace them wouldn't have equally unfortunate effects. But in February this year, GSK paid £250 million to settle 5,500 suits at an average of $46,000 per plaintiff. And they've paid that before, so they've paid a total of $770 million for something which probably has no real merit in it at all. Um, 
I regard this as the equivalent of paying um, hostage takers, actually. It just encourages um, this unfortunate practice, and it is unfortunate. Just have a look at this, for example. This is from an American website. This is a sort of ambulance-chasing lawyer. They're actually seeking these patients. They advertise in the public to find patients who would like to take part in these class actions um, so that they can make a lot of money out of it, too. And just for good ways, they're doing the other one for bladder cancer as well. All cases are investigated with no fees unless a recovery is obtained. Well, that's America, but I think this is even worse. I was sent an email with this just the other day. This is somebody who wishes me to invest in a fund which is going to pay me a high lot of interest by running class actions. I think this is totally immoral. They're hoping to raise five million pounds. Um, they guarantee a fixed rate of 8% or 9% if you have annual income. And they have 25% of each winning case's net profits. I, I'm actually quite surprised that this is still legal. It's certainly immoral. And that's in this country. Um, the Legal Services Commission comes out of it slightly better. Um, this is an a class action against Sanofi Pasteur, French company, about sodium valproate, which is a very valuable anti-epileptic drug um, that's also claimed to cause birth defects. Uh, the Legal Service Commission spent three million pounds on a class action which never came to conclusion and then withdrew it because they were advised by counsel there was no prospect of success. Uh, the second thing, the plaintiff's lawyers were not at all pleased with that not because the battle in court was lost, was continuing with too great a financial risk for the claimant. Also concerned about legal aid funding for group actions to ensure proper access to justice for individuals who suffer serious drug-induced injuries. Well, they would say that, wouldn't they? But it isn't just money. The litigation outsider can also kill. And this is perhaps the most tragic case of all, uh, and this is the Wyeth rotavirus vaccine. Wyeth made a rotavirus vaccine in 1998, good vaccine, quite effective, um, against this virus which causes 40% of all severe diarrheal diseases all over the world. In the West, of course, it doesn't usually kill people, um, though it can send them into hospital for a time. In Africa, this is a major cause of death, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, it has a side effect, it causes intersusception where bit of gut folds itself into the next bit of gut because the lymphoid tissue in the gut is swollen. Um, it happens in children from time to time anyway. It's not usually lethal. Um, uh, but it was found to be associated with increased incidence. I've given the higher estimate here, one in 10,000. Others say one in 16,000 extra cases. Wyeth then withdrew the vaccine in the United States because it felt that it might not be acceptable because the disease isn't that severe. And on legal advice, I am told, they withdrew it worldwide because they felt told they would certainly get sued if they withdrawn it in the United States and continue to use it in the third world, although the risk-benefit ratio is totally different. Uh, new vaccines took eight or more years to evolve. Merck had a new one in 2006 and GSK in 2008, which give a little bit less. Well, they do give less, probably about 150,000 extra cases, but they also give them at a slightly different time. Between 1999 and 2006, approximately 3 million children died of rotavirus infection in Africa. And that's really quite scandalous. And just to give you some idea um, about childhood deaths less than five, this is Africa, um, this is all of Europe, this is South Asia, uh, there's almost none you see here, and this is the this is the diarrhea bit. You see the big yellow one and neonatal causes, which are quite different, uh, birth injuries and things. Um, pneumonia is, I beg your pardon, I keep doing that. Uh, pneumonia is slightly more common, but it's a huge cause of death, as I say. About three million children may have died unnecessarily. They wouldn't all have been vaccinated at once, but of course the new vaccines will take time to come in too. So if there were no other reason for doing something about this, uh, this is one of them. And the reason for all this um, is an unfortunate um, practice in the law that they recognize a distinction between harm caused by action and harm caused by inaction. This doesn't just apply to um, vaccines, which we're talking about, but also active and passive euthanasia. 
Um, you can't give people drugs to help them on their way, but you can starve them um, or refuse to give them drugs. Ethically, whether there is a difference between omission and commission in doing harm is very contentious, and you can read um, cases on both sides. I wouldn't wish to take a strong quote on this generally, particularly because Nora O'Neill believes there is a difference. But in the context of a doctor's duty of care to patients, um, I think there is no doubt that there is no difference. And we did once have a vote of this in a medical meeting, and at least 90% of the people present agreed. Um, uh, in this particular context, to dis have this distinction is meaningless. And I, I will take the opportunity of quoting to you from one of your late colleagues, um, Lord Donaldson, who wrote a letter to the Times in 1974, which is worth quoting. He says, what has become of the age-old medical commandment, thou shalt not kill, but needst not strive officiously to keep alive? And what's happened to the well-known distinction between board and treatment, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, I wrote an answer to the Times. They didn't publish it, so I mean, you are seeing it here. Uh, Lord Donaldson is wrong in writing, thou shalt not kill, but needst not strive officially to keep alive, is an age-old medical commandment. It is neither. Um, it's neither old, and, and certainly not a medical commandment. It's a quotation from Arthur Clough's uh, clergyman and Victorian poet who wrote very memorable poems. Deeply ironic rendering of the Ten Commandments, known as the latest Decalogue. And if you don't believe that that is meant ironically, try the next two couplets. Thou shalt not steal an empty feet when it's so lucrative to cheat. Thou shalt not covet, but tradition approves all forms of competition. And he goes through all ten of the Ten Commandments this way. And though I didn't know Clough, I imagine he would be mortified to have this used as a, as a legal precept for how to treat people. Um, so what do we do? I think, I do hope you'll take a list of this with you. You should require proof of direct causality before compensation is due. It shouldn't be just on the basis of uh, statistical association. No win, no fee arrangements would really be abolished as they once were. They do encourage things like people who set up these funds for actually profiting out of this. Um, indemnities should be made legally binding, and I understand that this means abolishing strict liability and replacing it with a tort of negligence in respect of medicine so that risk-benefit can become central to making decisions as is entirely sensible. And try to abolish, at least in part, the distinction between harm caused by commission and omission. And finally, and this is slightly different and more for a government than for lawyers, is to ensure the NHS is adequately financed to provide necessarily care for all, um, including those who suffer dry defects, um, but even those where there's nobody to be blamed. And it is just worth pointing out that a lot of this litigation culture is imported from the United States. And in the United States, the situation really is totally different. Having no national health service and a large part of the population are not adequately insured, um, the financial consequences of illness are a great disaster, and the attempt to try to recoup this whenever you can, even if it does um, harm on the side, is more understandable than it is here, and we're in a much better position uh, to do without this. And finally, um, uh, my last slide, the thought of which I leave you is a modern rendering of Hippocrates' famous dictum, <laughs> primum non nocere. <laughs> and I thank you for your attention.